document that would have what those motions are and how you know what they were passed and seconded and then um the link to the video would be in that document does that make sense so yeah it should be it should real be. seamless So looking so for the, quorum, it, we haven't started the meeting yet. We're looking for quorum, but we have three um, folks who have called in who are called in call in users. Um, if any of you are board members, could you let me know? Uh, could you just say your name? Hi, yeah, Adrian. This is Jerry. I'm on the phone. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, so we don't Not have near quorum. quorum. No, nope. no, no. Not anywhere near quorum. No, we're actually pretty close. We only need one more. Oh, really? Well, we're down to twelve. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, because at this point, uh, and I don't, I don't think he's on here yet. Um, Gordon can be a part of the meeting, but he has he hasn't been officially. The process hasn't finished, so we can't really have him vote or do motions. So that makes our memberships 12. But we just need six for quorum. So we are close. We've got five. Anybody hear from anybody that they weren't going to be here? No, I knew Barry was on at like three and then was emailing <laughs> me. Um, but he did say he lost connection at, right at four, so I don't know if he's still trying to get on or not. Could be an even shorter meeting. <laughs> okay, I don't have any emails anywhere from people that I can find. And you send <laughs> out the connection, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, if you guys ever lose it, you can always go back into your calendar through Outlook and just pick up an old meeting because it's the same oh, link. Oh, okay. That's good to know. We shouldn't just email you over and over again, Kelly. <laughs> well, you could. I try to nothing respond, else to but... do right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and the challenge is that they're really, everything is sort of action oriented. So there, there isn't much we can do until we've got it, until or unless we have quorum. Oh, I got all excited. And I'm thrilled that Becky is here, but it turned out it's just Becky twice on here. So <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Nope. <laughs> So, George, what happens if we can't close the meeting? It stays open for the next year. <laughs> uh, sure. I don't know. I've never had that happen before. I know. Well, then we then we wouldn't have to keep opening and closing it. We could just say an ongoing, you know, event. <laughs> uh, yeah. No more supplemental changes. We just go. Yep, we're still yeah. waiting to close the meeting. It's it's just open forever. Like we're always evolving. <laughs> Let's just yeah. blame, we just blame COVID, just like yeah. everything. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> now we get to blame Delta. Yeah. Yeah. Could we do if, and I don't know if there is any, but could we do um, public comment without opening the meeting? It's being recorded. Oh, yeah, we can. Oh, wait. Nope. Nope. Not a good <laughs> nope. We got excited. We're so excited every time somebody new logs in. <laughs> Barry forwarded his meeting notification to his other email, so maybe he's still trying to get on. Okay. Maybe well, I had an might... email from Catherine. Well, we all did. We had an email from Catherine today, and I kind of expected her to be here. So, yeah. yeah it is what it is. It, was it maybe it was because I sent out that email requesting people commit to? That's it. <laughs> Barry's like, here. Oh, Barry's here. Yay! 
We don't have full confirmation yet. Just have his name so far. He has to be able to vote. Yeah. Oh, good. This I I. This is good. Okay. I've been, trying, I've been trying for 20 minutes to get back in on my laptop and I couldn't do it. I don't know why. Kelly can tell you I was in an hour early and then I lost it. Sorry. She did. She did. She did tell us that. Thank you so much for being here, Barry. We were in trouble of not having a, a quorum. So we, we need everybody here. Um, hopefully others will join us because we have some things to talk about. So uh, first, um, Calling the meeting to order a little bit late, uh, but the first action is the approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion or any changes anyone wants to make? Then can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? Barry so moves. Thanks, Barry. Second. Thanks, Thank Ann. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we got the first part done. We have an agenda. Um, so I know that we have um, Jerry is one of the one of our call in users. We have a couple of other call in users. Uh, uh, would either of the others uh, like to introduce themselves and or uh, share a public comment? Um, to our next uh, uh, agenda item, approval of the July meeting minutes. Are there any changes anybody needs to make? Hearing none, uh, can I get a motion to approve July's minutes? So moved, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Can I get a second? Second, Barry. Thanks, Barry. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have we have our minutes. Um, Kirsten, could you just for a moment, since we have the others here, talk about uh, the the change that in the minutes that we're going to see over the next couple of months? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, just to be a little bit more efficient and um, staying with the times, and we'll have to kind of reassess this when we um, do more in person or, or what that looks like in the future. But um, what we are looking to do is to um, actually record the meetings um, because we may have different people taking notes that aren't always in these meetings just to um, be efficient with staffing. And um, this this meeting itself will record and I will also be taking minutes, but it also gives us an opportunity to go back if you know, when we're doing the minutes to for accuracy. Um, but what those minutes would look like in the future is it would be um, basically the agenda with um, the topic. If there's a motion made and seconded, that would be indicated in the agenda in that document with a link to the recording of the um, of the meeting and with a time code so that people can just go straight to that time code to um, see what that is. Um, it seems like a much better use of time rather than transcribing um, words and things like that. So, um, so that is, unless people have real problems with that, we are still making sure that we one of our compliance things is that we have to provide minutes. Um, as one of our reporting things, and so we want to make sure that that format is um, acceptable. So um, we'll we'll continue to do both until then, but in the future, it just it, it kind of makes sense just to let people find it for themselves um, if they want to. So um, if if anybody has concerns, now would be a great time to share those. And I, I think just to just to reiterate what Kirsten was saying, um, you would have the option then to go into the timestamp to look at the video, but you wouldn't have to look at the video to approve the minutes because the action items and who made the motions will be uh, in the written copy. So we're not asking everybody to go relive the meeting again or anything like that. 
Yeah, all of the actions made would be actually on the document and it would still be posted on the website as a document. Um, and the link would be on that document, not on a separate place, if that makes sense. Will you include in the list who was at the meeting? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. it would look, yeah, it would have this, the start time, the attendees, yeah. um, the motions made, um, the, the time it was adjourned, um, next meeting time notice, um, all of that would be the same. It just wouldn't have that word for word content that could just be found by going to a time code on the link video. And, and board, board members always welcome to volunteer and say, I'd love to take the minutes. I, I'm not willing to do that, but, <laughs> but if somebody wants to. Um, and we might have to revisit it if, if having a board member take the minutes if um, this doesn't turn out to be in compliance with, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. how the minutes have to yeah. be. So, but, but hopefully this will work. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, did we get another? <laughs> Person oh, on, it looks like. Kinda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, Gordon. Hi, hey, Gordon. Gordon um, I just want to let you know that we still haven't gotten, even though you did your letter just as you were supposed to, the reappointment isn't official. Um, so we're glad you're here to be a part of the conversation and to act to act as much, but just um, if you could not do a motion or a second or vote. Um, so at least for this meeting, and hopefully we'll get it taken care of by the next meeting. So, but thank you so much for being here because there's some good discussions that we're going to have. Um, all right. Uh, so with that, we will shift over to George and the 2021 action plan. Great. So um, since this is being recorded, I'm just going to go ahead and show through the recording where the public can go and access the the documents. I'm not going to go through the whole presentation again, but just just to make sure that it's recorded how to do that. And I did this with city council as well when I briefed them um, last week. So let's see. Okay, you all should be seeing my um, web browser now. So um, this is just the homepage for the city of Spokane. Uh, click the drop down. I feel like you all could do this for me. You're so versed in this. Uh, click on CHHS. When you click on CHHS, it'll take you to our department web page. It's thinking. Um, and if you scroll down, we've got this banner down here um, along this banner, the public will see documents, plans and reports. When you click on that, it'll take you to um, a copy of the draft action plan, which is represented right here. And then the presentation that I gave last month regarding the annual action plan. So that's where the public can go to find those documents. Um, they will remain up for um, for some time. Um, you can see copies of prior years that are available there. So, um, and if the public wants a printout copy or something, they can certainly request that through the CHHS department. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there, and then I'm going to open up my document that I prepared for the um, to summarize public comment as we've received so far. This document is subject to change pending any public comments that we receive between now and Friday. So you should be seeing a Word document at this point soon. Can you all see it now? No. No. My computer is sounding like a bunch of uh, marbles are rattling around inside of it. So hopefully I'm not <laughs> I've seen this poor thing. Um, yeah, it's still thinking. 
anyways, it'll pop up eventually, but I'll just explain to you all what it says. So this is an attachment that I put into the annual action plan every year that describes the process that we went through to be able to solicit public comment. So effectively it says we had at the board meeting on July 7th, we presented the draft annual action plan for 2021. Um, and then from there, we have uh, gone to the public infrastructure uh, environment and sustainability committee. So um, I briefed council on Monday, July 26 on that, um, showed them where the documents were, were provided um, so that the public could see that. Um, and then council did not meet, um, I think it was this past Monday. Um, so got, we got bumped a little bit on when we briefed them. So we'll brief council on Monday, August 16th and then they're going to suspend the rules and um, do final approval on August 16th as well. So um, so that's the process that we've gone through for city council um, that I highlight there in that document. And then I also list out opportunities and ways for the public to make comment and that the public comment period, we are approving this um, or you all are approving this today for um, submission following public comment on August 6th. Um, and then our commitment, my commitment to the public is that any response that we receive, I will respond to no later than Friday, August 27th. So that is where we're at. So uh, I guess I explained all that without saying we have not received any public comment at this time, um, probably, well, I won't make an assumption that we won't. Hopefully someone will come in and say, hey, we have you guys considered this? Um, did we just lose George? I think we did. So can we, can we approve as written without George being here? I think we can. Let's, let's give him just a minute. But I'm sure if he can't get his computer back on, he usually, he'll usually call in. Yeah. That is if he knows what the number is, because if he can't get on his computer. <laughs> it is going so smoothly today. <laughs> what a day. Yep. <clears throat> I honestly don't think we have to wait for George if you want to move on because he he gave us the basic, which is no comments. So yeah. and the timeline. So I move that we accept. He just came back. There you are. You're muted. My apologies. Um, apparently, the marbles rattling around got the best of me. Um, I have no idea where I uh, fell off in that. You were talking about uh, being hopeful that we would yet to get a great comment uh, that would make some suggestions. Okay, well, I'll leave it at that then. <laughs> So, um, so public comment period ends effectively midnight this Friday, August 6th. Um, I encourage the public to take a look at that. Um, and then even if the public's looking at this recording later and they have any questions or comments outside of the public comment period, that's what we're here for is to have those conversations and engage with the public. So, um, so no, no opportunity to comment is, um, is lost. Um, there's just the formal comment period that that we're looking at here. So still encourage folks to engage. Any questions for George? So we need a, a motion to what? What was the date? I'm sorry that we need to close. Friday, Friday August six. So we need a motion to uh, close the the um, public comment 
official public comment, but the public can continue to comment uh, uh, on and accept the action plan with with uh, no comments or any comments that come in before Friday. Um, and to close that on Friday, August 6th. I so move. If I don't have to repeat it, I'll, I'll also move. I know, I kind of kept adding, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. It's being thank recorded, you. so. Yeah, thank you. Do we have a second? Barry will second. Thank you, Barry. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of accepting the action plan and closing Aye. it for public comment. Aye. Okay. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstention? All right, that action passes. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you all. Okay, and, and with that, we got we got back on time. So that worked out. We have some other board members that have joined us. Thank you for, for uh, joining us today. Um, just for those who tuned in a little bit, um, a little bit late uh, for your information, these, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so just uh, want to make sure, cause I don't know if the, I know on zoom, you don't <laughs> see the chat if it happened before you were signed in. So wanted to let you know that, that it is being recorded. Um, so our board education is, you know, more of a discussion than education. Um, I had sent out, uh, an email. I think a week and a half or two weeks ago, uh, looking, talking about what's happening as the board moves forward, recognizing um, a, that we have some vacancies now. Um, we also have um, a pretty small executive committee uh, because the executive committee is made up of the co vice chairs, the immediate past chair, uh, the chair, and the chairs of our committees. But right now, um, Anne is the immediate past chair and also the chair of the RFP committee. And I'm the, the current chair and also the chair of the affordable housing committee. So that has made that executive committee much smaller than it's supposed to be. Um, but it also doesn't bode well for transitioning as Anne and um, Rebecca, Sarah and I are all uh, coming up to next April is the end of our second term. Uh, so there's some leadership spaces that need uh, that need to be filled. Thinking about going forward. Um, also, it's the assumption of of the board that there's an obligation to be serving both on the board and in one other capacity. Now, some of our members are already serving in multiple capacities. Uh, council Member Wilkerson, for example, is is serving on City Council, so the expectation isn't that you would also pick up another committee. But you're welcome to, but you're not required to, or we're not asking you to. Um, so, so we recognize that. So that, so that right now, what we have are we have we have the two standing committees, the affordable housing committee and the RFP committee, um, as options for board members to be a part of, and for board members to be seriously considering moving in toward a leadership role in those committees. As Ann and I are going, it has to be a board member that's a chair of those committees. Um, additional opportunities that I sent out would be to be the continuum of care liaison. Um, and, uh, um, so that's that you could do that in lieu of being on either of those of those committees. Um, we've also had a transition that I don't believe that the full board is aware of, uh, where board member Dylan Thorpe has stepped away from the board. Uh, he's our co vice chair. That's part of why that position is open. Um, Dylan gave me permission to share a little bit with you about why he stepped away. Um, he uh, um, really grew a lot and appreciated working with everyone on the board and really appreciated working with the city staff. Felt like he learned so much. Um, he was actually sort of the person that was next in line for becoming chair um, at the end of the year. Uh, and with the turnover, frankly, that he's seen in the staff with concerns around um, uh, how Cupid left, um, uh, all of those things weighed heavily on him. And he took some time to reflect on whether he felt he could still um, best served by being on this board. And he frankly felt like he couldn't authentically serve with some of the concerns that he had. 
so, so that's why he stepped off and and uh, uh, so that makes things a little bit more challenging for the leadership position. Um, but I just also want to take a moment, um, especially since it's being uh, videoed and and officially thank him for his service. He worked so hard. He was very passionate. Um, he came to us uh, really <coughs> young, have, having never thought of being on a board before, but had lived experience. And he thought that he was in a position that he could contribute. Um, and uh, I, you know, I we're still in touch. I wish him the best in whatever he does next. I think he did learn a lot from being here. Uh, and if you, you know, if you would be interested, I'm sure he would appreciate people, folks reaching out to him. Um, it was really hard for him because he didn't want to feel like he was letting the board members down or the staff down, but it also was the decision he needed to make at that time. Um, so that's also why uh, when I talk about the two committees, I didn't include the communications committee, um, the, the ideas that we had for that committee, uh, because Dylan was really the one that was pushing that. And Jason, Jason um, just so you all recall, um, board member who's not here today, although he's going to be rescheduling things so he can be with us uh, in September. Um, his his work is mental health. So as one <laughs> might imagine, it's been really incredibly busy for him. Uh, and it's uh, uh, great expertise to bring to the board, but it's been a challenge for him. And he didn't feel like he was in a position where he could push forward the communications um, committee by himself. And frankly, Staff has their hand full right now with far fewer folks trying to do all sorts of work. Um, and so at this point, unless there is interest from others to keep working on that committee and trying to bring that to fruition, uh, we were going to put a hold on that. So we don't, we just don't have the people right now for, for that. Um, any questions about all that? So we're really in this position and Anna, I'll let you. I'm sure a little too, um, and anybody else can chime in. We're in this position where I've heard from um, two, you know, three board members. Um, so thank you, Barry and Gordon, for responding um, about some of the things that you're interested in doing. Um, I wanted to further this discussion during this meeting, so then executive can look over some of the things that that people um, <coughs> have suggested they'd be interested in. I also heard from Catherine who. Uh, um, was sort of interested in wherever we think that would be a good spot for her. Um, so this really is a call to, to action to find out uh, where we are, where we're standing with board members, their interest in the affordable housing committee, their interest in the RFP committee, and their interest in uh, leadership roles uh, in both of those and or uh, for the board. Um, Jerry, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when, when I say that as co vice chair um, at this stage, you're not. You don't have capacity to step into the chair role um, when that transition takes place. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're really kind of looking at a. A leadership mm -hmm. issue coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a question to me. Um, Adrian, this is Jerry. I. Would not feel ready to take on the the role of board chair, but I would consider the role of um, RFP chair if needed. If that if that is something that is needed, I know Anne is in that position now, but we we do need that. <laughs> yeah, and and I'll remain on the committee as an ex board member. I can stay on. Just not as chair. Just not as chair, right? Okay. So it's not, it's like not, you know, that, you won't be alone. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> You'll have the yes. expertise. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. And I would be interested in joining the affordable housing committee, which I'm not currently participating on. Councilmember Wilkerson, did I see your hand? Yeah, Adrian, since I missed a meeting, I just wanted clarity of how many vacant positions there are on this committee for my own info. Absolutely. So right now there are two openings with Dylan stepping down. Um, that's assuming uh, that uh, 
Gordon's reappointment will go through. Gordon sent it in, in the reappointment letter for his second term. And it's our understanding it's on the mayor's desk, but I'm not sure. But, you know, so it hasn't come before council yet. So he's not officially, but I'm assuming he's going to get that that second term. Um, and then uh, in April, Anne, myself and Rebecca Cerro all step off. That's the end of our second term. So that will so be the five. It will be five. And so one of the we didn't anticipate um, Dylan's position. Uh, one of the reasons we hadn't opened up right away the application for that last spot was because we wanted to have a, a, a discussion and we wanted to do it in a more formal way where we open the application, advertise for the for the position and close it so we can get. So it's not just people asking their friends <laughs> so that we're getting a better, a better response, hopefully a more diverse response. So we were going to we were going to do that with all of the positions at once shortly, like set, starting in September to and because it takes a while. Bob, the liaison position that you're talking about, what what what's entailed with that? And, and um, so the continuum of of care board meets, I believe. Is it the 4th um, Wednesday? Uh, at the uh, um, at three thirty, I think so. It's pretty similar to the to the times that, that we meet. So it would require att attend attending as much as possible those meetings, um, providing a bridge between the CHHS board and the COC, and and hopefully they too will have a liaison. So you won't be doing this. That person wouldn't be doing it alone. Um, but you would attend the meeting. You would be um, at the table, so to speak, sharing what what we're working on. Um, engaged in those in the in the, those discussions, it's it's a non-voting position, um, but it is a position where you're sharing that information. So we have that bridge. I'd be interested in doing that. Adrian, this is Kelly. Uh -huh. um, I believe at one of the older a couple meetings past since Ben's been there, um, they discussed not having a CHHH liaison, being that if we had one, they didn't need somebody there. Oh, okay. Doing the same work. But I could be incorrect. We'd have to double check. I think that's what they decided not to do. That's why we don't have anybody in attendance anymore. Okay. I know that she had stepped. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. The last day had, had stepped away because of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because she felt because she felt like it was a redundant position. So, okay. so that person, and that's that's okay. That person then would would need to be able to bring back pretty, pretty good notes about what's going on, so we make sure that 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 bridge is effective. So that would be a discussion to have with them because I think it's still beneficial that we have somebody go to that meeting. It's a public meeting, so anybody can go. Right, and then I also think, I mean, the board minutes for their meetings are also up on the website as well. I mean. I know it means more reading, but that's another option too. I mean, if people really wanted to go through, but they're also being recorded as well. So, I mean, we, until we figure out that process, if it works or not. So, and and I would say the COC liaison position is a very important position, um, and I and I have a lot of uh, a lot of interest in that position. But for the health of this board, we really also need people willing to serve on the RFP uh, committee and on the affordable housing committee and and be willing to, um, with assistance, be moving into leadership positions on those. Anything you want to add, Anne? No, actually, other than, you know, it. It really is good to get involved. Um, um, being a chair, being one of the co-vice chairs really gives you some insight what's going on more so than just this meeting. So I recommend it. I would also add, um, I think that there's a, a healthy concern um, when, if you've been, you know, just attending board meetings once a month and you, you we throw out all these initials of things and 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 you're concerned that you don't have a, a grasp on the lay of the land. Um, 
Anne and I felt, and, and Rebecca felt, Rebecca's on now, and, and felt pretty much the same way as we stepped into yes. COVID chair positions and things like that. And that, and, and or stepped into the positions on the different committees. And it was really that work where you get to dig deep, a little bit deeper and more specifically into certain areas um, that you get a much better understanding. So the, the expectation isn't that somebody that steps into that role already understands everything and is an expert at it and has, mm -hmm. has it well, you know, uh, in their grasp, but rather it does help you be a much more effective board member as well, I think. Well, well, if that liaison position isn't needed, then I'd be happy to help with the affordable housing committee. That'd be great, Bob. I think that's a really good fit. Any other questions about the committees or about the up upcoming leadership changes? So, Barry, I, I just want to understand, are you willing to be a vice chair? You want to be the executive vice. committee. It's the only way to get there, Barry. So, and that means being a vice chair of what? Of the board. Oh, um, I would like to attend an executive committee meeting, see what how that works, learn a little bit more about what it does. I have an interest in it, yes. I'm not ready to say right now I will do it, but I'm interested. Uh, and, and my notes say I'm also, I definitely am interested if we had a COC liaison, I'd be happy to do that because I go to those anyway. Um, and I have waning interest in the affordable housing committee, but if subcommittee, but I'll be happy to stay if you need somebody. RFP, not interested at all. So that's, <laughs> that, does that give you an idea of where I am? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. And, and my understanding from what Kelly said was that because we were having a liaison on the on the COC committee, they weren't doing the opposite. So so we that position still is a position for, for our oh, okay. They're just not gonna put one on ours. Right. Got yep. it. Okay. Adrian, just call me COVID brain. I just haven't re quite recovered yet. So where are we going to do the outreach for new board members? That's a concern of mine. How, what was that? What does that look like? Um, so we have started talking about uh, talking to um, Kristen about this during uh, the last executive committee meeting, uh, and she had some 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 ideas. I think that that's an open discussion to talk about as part of what we're going to talk about today. Where where there are some gaps in in the past, it's you know really just been it's either been a rolling application, so they just those applications just come in randomly, which then could often mean that. Oh, there's a position open and we happen to have gotten one application and, and, you know, so we kind of do that. Um, it has been done by uh, word of mouth. So that's actually 1 of our concerns is that it has not been done in a more formal process. Um, using good communication methods to cast a wider net and invite more folks to apply. Um, I, so that probably doesn't answer your question, um, Kristen. I know you're probably working on 27 different things, but did you did you hear the question? We have talked a little bit at, at Exec about how we might better share right. the information on the board. Can you contribute anything to that? Right. So one of the things that um, Harley Portwright and um, Cindy Fort Miller are doing is um, standing up our city volunteer program a little bit more. Um, which includes, uh, you know, links with board and commission um, volunteers and, and things like that. But we also have more tools than we've had before. We have a weekly um, community update newsletter that goes out to, oh, about 90,000 emails with about a 27% open rate. Um, we can target things with our, with our um, social media pages. Um, and do, you know, just a little bit more of a description as to what, what this opportunity is and the kind of people that we're looking for so that we can be a little bit more targeted. And then um, from there, we can put together some messaging um, to work with our, you know, community partners and those that would have a, a better understanding as to what 
um, this role would be and um, they keep those people out. So I think first the goal would be to, um, I think first the goal would be to have a discussion about, you know, what kind, is, is there, what's your strategy around your board membership? So, um, you know, some boards, uh, they want an attorney and they want to, you know, <laughs> they want all these kind of categories of business represented. Um, some boards, you know, aren't that um, targeted, that sort of thing. So once you kind of know what you're looking for, um, and I like the idea of promoting them all at once and, and rather than the rolling thing, um, then you can get them onboarded at the same time. And I think they kind of bond together at, at the same time and create a little bit of a of a bond that carries them through um, their their terms. Um, so, so we have lots of ways to, to get the message out. We're also working on doing some videos with, um, with cable five that we can promote on, um, well, on cable five, but as well as on um, our social media channels to kind of give people an idea of, of what opportunities are available. And this would be one of those. Does so that in, answer your question? It, it does, but just so you know, in our uh, board bylaws, we, are charged with having members of the community that we represent because we're citizen advisory and they must be non-conflicted. Those are the two main things. So we're not necessarily looking for business people. It would be great. Um, it's not necessary for any one particular kind of um, person joining the board. But we do have those two mandates. And, and, and Rebecca, are you saying that we have another one? Like the chat? Oh, I'm saying that, sorry, my house is a little echoey today. I'm saying that we put together a document from the strategic planning system session yep. where we talked about board priorities in regards to the type of members and how, and we made some kind of plans for how to recruit and so it would be useful to revisit that instead of saying like instead of needing to start from scratch because i think what kristen is saying it's a really good point like if, yeah. if you're going to make a reach out make sure that you're clear and even if it's not quote unquote a lawyer we certainly do have things that we're looking for we're looking to expand the diversity of our board in a variety of different ways and so that i think is important so thank you, Kristen, for bringing it, for bringing that to everyone's attention. Yeah, it's valuable. And, and most of you know, it took you a while to get on the board. Um, in seven months, three of us are gone, and we already have two openings. So, um, yeah. And it's the same with the leadership, quite frankly, people. Seven months, two of your key leaders are gone. So. Go ahead, Gordon. So, for about the last year, I've been approached by someone from Goodwill that's involved with the support of services for veterans and family program. And, uh, yeah. He's asked me a few times about how does he get on the board and uh, how would he, you know, how would I, so if you get somebody approaching you, no, I'm not really sure how he, he didn't find out about it through me, but he, he I think he, he heard something about the affordable housing committee. So he was asking about that. And then I, how I was um, appointed and, uh, as being a member of the CHH task board, and uh, I was on the committee, but I would look into it for him. So when we're approached by somebody, if we're looking to recruit people, what would that process look like? How do we bring a, a somebody that's interested, maybe has something to do with housing in the community, and they're interested, and and they might have a lot to offer. Um, how would we go about um, introducing them or, or guiding them or referring them? How, do, how yeah. does it work? So Gordon, um, so right now we don't have that rolling application, but um, I there have been people that have reached out to me that I have a list that when we do 
um, uh, when we do open up that application, I will send it directly to them that it's that it's live. Um, but oftentimes what we've done in the past with that kind of recruiting is or where, where somebody is looking to be recruited uh, is that they speak with um, uh, the, the chair of the board or the chair of the committee that they're interested in. Um, always our biggest challenge is uh, um, we're constrained by our, our no conflicts of interest in a pretty radical way. So you can't work for, get services from, consult with if you're being paid, um, or be on the board for anybody that we uh, that we fund. Uh, and so that's always one of the biggest challenges. However, some of those folks are often the best folks who um, maybe they're conflicted, but they have somebody great who just got a, a job in private industry and, and but has the background and would be a great housing expert or something like that. Um, so, so that's also a way to think about it when you're talking to somebody is, is being real clear about this conflict issue, but saying, but maybe, you know, someone who just stepped away because like, we fund goodwill. I assume in their, their, don't we some fund their employment services or haven't we? Well, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, there's been little, not a whole lot of discussion around employment. Um, I'm not sure what CHS does regarding anything to do with the employment. And then, and then the key is that um, it's non-conflicted to the point as, as well that if um, uh, if they are interested in a, in applying um, down the road for some some of the funds that um, that we make recommendations on, they would have to step away well before the process starts. So. That's why we have to do the annual review of, of conflict of interest. Um, so that would be that's usually a discussion. Usually um, we get a list sort of of the things that people folks are involved in in various ways, whether it's their employment or it's their um, uh, if they're on boards or things like that. And uh, with the help of uh, of the staff, which is another reason why this might take a, a little bit longer since we're we have so many fewer staff that are that are so stretched right now. Um, they can check to see if there's conflict. Yeah, and I totally get that. You know, it's just, uh, um, you know, all that would be passed on. And I'm sure anybody interested in, in applying or wanting to become a, a board member would understand. You know, it's uh, probably obvious if there's a conflict, or maybe even not so obvious, but if it's, you know, there may be, you know, I'm sure they'd understand that. Uh, but but still, that would all come out during the process. I mean, you wouldn't want to just turn away people that might be interested. And so, I'm looking. Yeah, I, could, yeah. I, could be, I do a lot of networking. I get around, and uh, you know, it can be, uh, I mean, I mean, recruiting and outreach. You know, I'd like to be part of that. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that that is a great help and and that's, you know, it won't be um, uh, when we do make it uh, when we do move forward and, and make the application live, that will be a request for for certainly all of the all of the board members are to think about their networks and and folks who um, as we as we talk about some some of the gaps. Um, uh, or expertise that we're looking for, uh, hopefully uh, also board members, but we always want to be careful as, as great as we are as recruiters, um, boards can get a little homogenous if it's the board doing the recruiting of folks that they know as well. So we want to be thoughtful about that and make sure we're also casting the net in other directions, but that would be such a great help Gordon. And, um, uh, I'm I'm happy and and usually the executive committee and maybe Rebecca um, I don't know if she has any time could step into since she's had a longer um, tenure on the board um, could meet with somebody to talk to them sort of about what it's like to be on the board what the expectations are those sorts of things sure sure all right yeah oh Adrian this is Gary I've got a a request this conversation is really good that you and Gordon are having right here. And this is kind of a, a light request or a very um, low expectation request, but it would be so helpful to have a list of the organizations that are funded um, or have been funded or potentially are funded. And I don't like, I say this is a very low expectation request because I know probably um, how 
how much is on staff's plate right now so I don't want to add something that's extra burdensome. Um, but if it's easy to pull, like if this isn't a system and that's easy to get, I think that'd be really helpful. Move from the idea of like considering, um, you know, this, you know, who might be conflicted, you know, like what organizations would constitute a conflict, but then also honestly like a place to be like, okay, yeah, like you said, like maybe we can go to some of those organizations and be like, who, um, who might you recommend serve on this board? And then also just as a board member to have a good understanding of, of who we're funding would be, would be useful. I'm nodding, Jerry, but you're on the phone, so sorry about that. Yes, that, that, that uh, is a great recommendation. So um, for those who are on the phone, um, Rebecca put in, in chat uh, the, the, the plan for um, reshaping, uh, reshaping the board um, and with some suggestions of, of who we wanted to go out to. Um, and it's, we sort of have this question, and this is part of the discussion um, for right now. Uh, you know, the sort of who, who are we missing? What expertise are we missing? What perspectives are we missing? Um, that also might shape the way that we do the communicating uh, um, where, where we make sure that we're advertising um, the opportunities to, to serve on this board. Uh, and that's that's sort of uh, looking at this. I think we had brainstormed some things, um, and this is in the chat, but I'm going to read it because not everybody's on the video. So I want to make sure everybody can can see this. But some of the things that we um, that we talked about uh, was uh, banking and development experience uh, and lived exper and lived experiences, and lived experiences it, uh, is particularly helpful. Um, as we've lost the member of the board that that really brought some of that perspective. Um, so we didn't have other than a general sense of being intentional about having um, a, div uh, a diverse board. So it's sort of a balance between um, this expertise and and uh, personal experience, but also wanting to make sure the board isn't say as it sort of when it first started, it was primarily a board of retired folks who had the time and the, <laughs> and the ability to serve on the board. And there's always a challenge with all volunteer boards um, that meet at 4 p.m. on a work day and, and getting uh, the perspectives that we would like to, to have join us. Um, but I, I think we need to really be specific about some of the areas that we feel like we're there's gaps that we need to fill. So I would just like to open that to some suggestions uh, that the that board members have about or staff have about uh, gaps that we seem that we seem to have. I think we have a gap in uh, affordable housing or housing expertise. Well, and part of the challenge, and I'll be honest with you, is the conflict of interest because you're looking for people that have certain expertise. But yet, we don't allow those expertise on when we could, I think we could gain so much. I think the better board could be a much better board if, if we could somehow bridge that gap. Because I think we're leaving great expertise and great people on the sidelines that could actually help us move forward. And Bob, we... Um, I trust me, <laughs> Anne, Anne and I have, have uh, yeah, um, we have, we have pushed that because the COC doesn't have, uh, as stringent rules, but the way that the, the HUD rules are being interpreted by the city attorney is that it's a clear, no, you can't, you can't. In fact, we had somebody who, um, uh, uh, was coming on the board and had, just had a, a, a new position at the YWCA at nothing to do with advancement or things like that. And she was about to be on the board and she couldn't come on the board and take that job. So even though there's discussions about how far away she would be from any sort of requesting for funding. So um, our, our hands are tied 
um, what we can do is be thoughtful about having those folks come and do board education for us. Uh, so we can be much more intentional about, wow, since we're having such a hard time filling this area of expertise because everybody's conflicted, who can come and help us learn and, and be better um, well, uh, in that area? Because I'll be honest, within probably the next six to seven months, there's a good chance that I'll be in conflict. And so then I will no longer be on the board just because, yeah, yeah. you know, and that's that's the reality of it. Well, and, and we had hoped that this communication committee would be another way, one of recruitment and two, to bring in people that might be conflicted, but could provide the education, the discuss, dis, discussion um, that could be brought forward to the board. So that was one of the, the ways that we wanted the communication committee, but it, that's going to be tabled for now. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, but I have to scoot, folks. So um, I will talk to you later. Thanks so much for being here, Bob. Uh -huh. Other thoughts of of gaps um, or skill sets or expertise or experience. And I and so I want to. I'll just take a minute. I'll let you brainstorm for a second. And you can tune me out, or you can, or you can listen. Um, but I just want to, I just want to give a little bit of a reminder of the role that this board plays. And and spoke earlier about us being a citizen advisory board. Um, we sit in a really interesting place where we're appointed by and confirmed by, we're appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. But we really serve the citizens. We serve as the citizen advisory board for these pass through funds, um, and so we're meant in part to look like the citizens that we're, that we're um, uh, representing. And we have, this interesting, we have this interesting position where that's where our focus and concern is. Some, sometimes that gets muddy um, and there's an assumption that we're serving um, administration or we're serving council because we provide those recommendations, but we're really serving the community. So when we think about this board, it's important to be thinking about, okay, who are we missing um, that would help ensure that we're better serving our community as a whole. Um, and that's why experience, lived experience is important, but so too is particular expertise that we might be missing. And so we wanna be really thoughtful about that and taking that role seriously. Uh, Barry, yeah, any, anybody, they, anybody could give a, a public comment. Um, it's, it is restricted by time. I think it's uh, three minutes, um, and it's uh, um, has to be. You know, it has to be about <laughs> the work that we're doing. Um, but yes, it is appropriate for for that um, uh, for anyone mm -hmm. to give us public comment. I was just thinking for a limited time. You know, we're, we're we wish we had some more expertise on the board. Okay, we can't because of conflict of interest. Could we ask? certain people, hey, you can't be on the board, but come and talk to us. Tell us what your view is here. And it's just a, a way to get more input. But but that needs to be at the beginning. And we have to make sure that it is not a program. If we're approving some uh, applications, um, we could not have one of the people that's applying to come in and talk at that point. Yeah, yeah. I know we can't um, have applicants come and talk to us. No. But if we haven't want an expert on low income housing, because we, yep. we have to make a general decision about maybe three yeah. different applicants, okay, not you, but somebody right. else who has a deep knowledge of this, of the issues here, give us a little bit of education, help us right. out. Right. And we've had people that w were conflicted come and during the opening, the three minute, five minute opening, they've come and made statements. They've showed us some stuff and, you know, um, later on it got approved and it went forward. So, but a week or, or months later, so that can happen too. But we have to make sure that people don't think they can, as we're, let me tell you about the program you're about to approve. No. Yeah. 
where the so program we have, yeah, we didn't have, And I think this is another um, difference. Uh, it's been, it, you know, when we were meeting in person, we would have mm -hmm. folks who were maybe new service providers to the area that wanted to share the work that they were doing and would bring pamphlets or things like that. Not during a funding cycle, not, you know, not at those times, but they would use that public comment to share what they were doing. So any other thoughts about gaps that we may have? I'm, I will add, um, we don't have, uh, we don't have, and this, we won't have once to Rebecca and I uh, term off we won't have anyone in education. Um, in the past, we've had K through 12 and we've had community colleges. Rebecca and I are both from university systems, but um, there won't be someone. I think K, K through 12 or community colleges is probably, it's probably the, the biggest gap um, because we would also often learn a lot about those experiencing housing insecurity and those things from folks who were in the K through 12 program that doesn't often get captured in some other Mm -hmm. metrics that we look at. Um, so I, I would suggest suggest someone in that area. We used to have school liaisons that would come and and be on the board, but but that's gone away. Actually served on the board. And that would be my point about outreach. If we put something in whatever EWU or Gonzaga has uh, to, to make that known. So at that point, I feel we'd be much more targeted in our outreach, to get the kind of people to apply we want. And, and I, I mean, I think that that's, I think as we sort of put together the description and we put together um, some of the particulars that we're looking for, we would bring them that back to the board to see if we're missing anything or need to change it and, and to um, uh, set and to make sure that we're getting it to the right places and more targeted specific sorts of recruiting. Not to sound like a broken drum, too. So when we get back to the, the workforce development and, and, you know, we bring that in. Um, I know at one point I somebody tasked me with contacting Kevin Williams at WorkSource and I and, and I had asked him, you know, if he'd be interested in being on the board and he said, yeah. but then um, nothing came of it. Um, I don't know if COVID hit or what it's been so much because at one point. There was a committee actually put together, and I think Rebecca Cerro was part of it. And uh, there was a number of people for workforce development, but we never met because COVID hit and it went away. Well, then it was um, the original committee, Gordon, that you were on way back, was taken away from from our board. You know, like maybe three years ago or two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, two years. Yeah. Okay. Diane is still upset about it. <laughs> Diane's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if and when that comes about, you know, um, I would like to be educated on, you know, and, and just the whole just the work force community, you know, who to approach, who can I approach, who am I, ta can't, you can task me to approach people, you know, I can be part of that, you know, um, when you figure out who wouldn't be a conflict of interest, you know, I mean, there's so many different programs and agencies all uh, part of this uh, employment collaborative. So, um, Anyway, I'd be looking forward to that along with other, I know there's lots of other gaps missing just because of all the people as, as a 
uh, as uh, someone doing like an internship on affordable housing and just listening in and and listening to you know going to Kelly Keenan and Paul and and all these to me mm -hmm. professors, it's like I'm going to school when I attend these meetings, yeah. and I just try to take notes and learn. But uh, they're seeing them gone. You know, who's going to be their replacement? That's a big question, Gordon. Any so please continue to uh, send thoughts. Uh, executive committee uh, has always sort of served as the ad hoc um, recruiting committee. Um, but my thought is we'll we'll try to brainstorm something that we put together and then bring it back to the board and discuss and see if anybody wants else wants to be involved in the actual recruiting. As Gordon mentioned, he'd be interested maybe in doing some of some of that outreach and recruiting. Um, but that would be the plan going forward. So so please uh, reach out if you all of a sudden think of uh, if you think of a person, um, you can you can send them my way or you can just let them know when that application becomes available and uh, um, uh, let them know about that. Uh, uh, so, um, but if you come up with some other ideas of some other gaps or other agencies um, that we might maybe should reach out to, uh, let's just keep sharing that information. Um, so, the next part of the discussion, um, well, we've run a little late, but this will be quick. The next part of the discussion, um, so, Anne and I um, have been concerned with the fact that we're going to be uh, terming off at the uh, at the end of April, um, especially in, in our leadership roles and, and also losing Rebecca at that same time. Uh, and so we had talked about um, some alternatives and uh, I was, con we were considering, um, especially since I won't have, since it's normal for the uh, immediate past chair to serve a year on the executive committee, and I would only be here until April, so not able to do that. Um, we were going to uh, ask that the board considers us making a request for me to stay on another year. Um, but there are things in, that Dylan described <laughs> that I'm also pretty concerned with. So, to be to be perfectly frank, I. Um, would like to table that action uh, because I am not certain that I can in good faith extend that that um, membership on the board. Um, this in no way reflects poorly on the staff who are doing amazing work uh, with so little. <laughs> and, uh, but it speaks to what Gordon was talking about with um, the losses that we've had in leadership the losses we've had in institutional knowledge. And I'm just uncertain that I can continue to serve in the same way that that I'm I'm to be just honest, I'm a little bit concerned um, about how well we're we're continuing to serve the community. So I would like to table that it's possible that I request it in the in the future or that we come back forward. Uh, but I need to do some Soul searching on that before I do that. Councilmember Wilkinson. Thank you, Adrian. That's a difficult spot, and I've been there myself on probably way too many occasions. But I just encourage you to follow your heart because sometimes we think if we stay, it's in the best interest or the uh, of the organization, but a lot of times it's not because it doesn't force us to move forward and we're just kind of, you know, band-aiding instead of really digging down um, to see what our next steps are. I, I would love to have you because you're just good that way, but recognizing that's the point of board terms is to always have new ideas and new people coming in and fresh people to do the work. Um, I think we're just at a very unique time. Um, just in the city and CHHS um, with some unique challenges. So I think you will hear this group will support you whichever way you go. So we'll keep that on the back burner. All 
All right, with that, uh, Kirsten, are you ready with the director's report? I am. Good evening. Can you everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so we have um, we have put out, and hopefully some of you got this um, information uh, that we have posted the CHHS director position. Um, if you have not, now you know. Um, this is a great group of people to um, spread the word to um, those that would be qualified and and great at leading this team. Um, we also have a series of uh, positions that are, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I thought someone had a question. We also are um, hiring program uh, people in the program manager, program professional, and program specialist positions um, to uh, make sure that that work is, continues. Um, obviously, it's no secret we are down staff. That's um, very obvious, uh, but we are focusing on compliance issues first and foremost um, and getting the work done. We do have um, staff that are very capable and stepping up to get this work done. So um, that is uh, that's the priority is to make sure that we are uh, getting what needs to get done done in order to, to be in compliance and making sure that our sub recipients and the community programs are getting the resources that they need. I also have are any questions on that. Um, I also thought that this group and, and Margaret is on this call as well, so she can um, answer any questions that people have them, but uh, remember when uh, this RFP group or uh, uh, chose the the funding the agencies to do our rent assistance? Um, I just thought you would appreciate an update. So um, so far we have had a total of one thousand five hundred and sixty three households who have applied for rent assistance. Um, Three hundred and thirty eight of those households have received assistance. And um, one one million nine hundred and seventy one thousand dollars has been paid in rent. So um, the money is coming in and, and getting out to the community, which is huge. Um, a few of the things that have uh, we really worked on, uh, you know, finding those um, hard to reach populations, and that seems to be working well. Uh, one of the things that it's been a challenge is in terms of we, we get applications in and we have it pending and there's very few re there's you know it's a pretty simple requirement however um, sometimes something that seems so simple is hard to get your hands on so our so providers have really had to do a lot of case management um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis to assist um, and provide technical assistance for folks to uh, get in the required documentation. And then the other piece of that that's kind of been a challenge as well is the landlord piece um, in that tracking that person down and having them um, provide the necessary information as well, or being able to get them um, yeah. the funding in a, in a way that they can accept it. So, uh, so that's a nice update for what's going on there. Um, Margaret can talk in more detail, but um, thought you guys would like to know where we are and we're and we have more funding coming, but um, this is where we are with the first round. So, so Margaret, uh, Councilmember Wilkerson here. So, have we deployed or have we allocated all the rental assistance money out to the community or to our partners? yet or how much are we still uh in our possession i guess it, it's all been allocated it's all been awarded out okay um we yeah. are expecting one more round from commerce from washington mm -hmm. state uh, we don't know how much that will be um and the plan for that would be to at this point to allocate to the, the current grantees perfect thank you How would that, I'm sorry, Margaret, how would that be divided up and who makes that decision? 
uh, for the, for the, the second round from commerce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not was, against the current people getting it, but how will you allocate that out? Oh, well, what we did with the, the other, um, Department of Treasury source that was directly awarded to the city was um, based on the percentage awarded to that to the, the original grantees. So, so divided it proportionately based on how the original award was divided. So I anticipate we would do the same thing between family promise and live stories. Regardless of who needs it or why they're going to how they're going to use it. Um, yeah, well, that's a, that's a great point and, um, it's something that it's we something are to think about and, yeah. and the RFP committee might be a good place to run that through. So you have input and then you can go forward and say, here's the recommendation. I don't think we'd be opposed to funding the same groups, but I think we need to look at what the need is. Yes. And thought. Yeah, no, that's a, an important thought, and and we are, you know, actively we're we're in daily contact with the partners and very on Good. top of um, the distribution and then and how it's going and and they're they're building up quite impressive distribution um, mechanisms. So um, we have good faith, but of course we'll be monitoring that. I, I think. This is Adrian. Could you remind us who? Because I, I I do remember that they had priorities or they were focused on certain uh, parts of the population. Could you remind us what the service providers what their focuses are? It, yeah, it was live stories, but live stories is actually also um, working with several community partners like mm -hmm. um, Northwest Mediation, Fulcrum Institute, um, Latinos in Spokane. Uh, the zone, the zone, world relief, um, world relief, and um, and there's probably a few more. And then Family Promise of Spokane, and then the Carl Maxey Center. One thing I want to point out, and I attend um, some of the meetings that they hold, is that this group of providers has been phenomenal, in my opinion, at working together and and making sure that. Um, really taking to heart when we refer to there's there's no wrong door so that if any one of them get an inquiry about um, needing assistance and maybe that you know maybe one of the other agencies is a better fit for them to refer them on um, and they've all been um, providing excellent um, data regarding who they're helping um, and uh, and how that's being done. So I gave you very overview numbers, but there's everything from demographic demographic breakdowns and things like that that we can certainly um, provide as well. So um, I've just been super impressed with um, the work being done, and even more impressed with how the three agencies have worked together um, to be creative and to you know some of them have um, have. Uh, more expertise in one area and, and lend a hand to another. And um, it's been really impressive. So just for clarification, am I correct that the 300 um, people involved are really agencies or do we know how many individuals have been helped? That's 338 households. So those would be okay. households. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, one, one more thing about that is um, what I think has been really great about what um, the agencies did when this rolled out and really working with the people that were making requests, um, it became very clear in the application process and the application review that um, people were only requesting the amount to get caught up that they were behind on and they were not requesting maybe the next month or two. And all of these agencies stopped and said, look, you know, let's get you solid, not just to date, but also moving forward so that you're, you know, you're not spinning your wheels again in a couple months and you can put this, this to rest. So 
it, it was um, very common that the award amounts were actually larger than the requested amounts for that reason. And that's all I have, unless anybody has questions. Um, so, Kirsten, I, I think you're anticipating this this question because uh, uh, we've had this conversation, and and I'm just curious um, because the affordable housing committee was informed that we weren't going to be doing uh, home funds this year, this cycle, and one of the requests I had was um, finding out first of all what happens with those dollars. Do they roll over? Do we lose those? What happens with that award? Is there is there pushback from HUD if we don't spend down those dollars? What's the status of those? And again, sort of um, framing this in, recognizing our responsibility to the community, and we have just had the the you know housing crisis, a housing emergency declared. The tenuous time to not right, lose right. funding opportunity. Right, and I apologize because uh, Becky and I just had that conversation uh, two hours ago, and that just already went. So um, I'm gonna Becky's gonna be much more versed in in explaining that. Um, so I'm gonna let her give you the um, the the real Im I mean, well, real impact in terms of um, without going into a two hour dissertation about how the home program works. Um, but what the impact of that is and, and really how it is set up and how it operates. Um, and then I can, uh, I can talk about how that fits into the priorities of the department. We'll see if Becky's microphone works. Hey, hopefully it does work. So I apologize if I've got this weird setup where I'm trying to, so you can see me. So it's just that my computer is weird. Um, and I'm still trying to see you on my two screen. So I apologize for the weird video, but uh, so it, it, with regards to, we all know about staff capacity and that there's limited capacity. So I first want to point out that with regards to what I'm able to complete, I'm managing the home program. I also manage CDBG capital project work. Um, I'm now helping with the continuum of care application that we're waiting for the NOFA to drop on. Uh, one of our um, our loan clerk person, she's out uh, for an undetermined amount of time. I'm picking that up as well. So I will say I'm doing probably around three jobs. Um, so when we talked about capacity and what's able to occur, the goal was to do a home RFI. Um, and so what that is is saying, you know, what projects are out there? Where are you at in your process? Um, you know. So we can understand what's coming down the pipeline because the home program funds are intended to be gap financing. So it's not going to fund an entire project. We're coming in at the last minute with some home dollars to get them across the finish line. So home funds from a year to year basis, it doesn't have the same requirements that we see with other programs like POC where it's required to be fully expended by the end of that term. That doesn't happen with, it's not required with home. Um, so, in your terms of like understanding where we are at in terms of expenditures and what would have to be expended this year, we're talking about projects that were funded multiple years ago. So that's a different conversation. We also need to understand that sure we have a housing crisis, um, but home dollars are talking about new construction for projects that take a couple of years to actually see a unit out in the community so somebody can move into it, right? Um, the home program, when we are doing an RFP, we should be starting that in June. And the timeline is intended to align with pro these projects because they're applying for low income housing tax credits more than likely. Those are the developers that are going to take a lot of our home money um, because the home program has restrictions around how much money we can provide to a one unit. It's also based on like if it's a one bed bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, how much money we can commit to that project, right? We all know that it's income restricted, right? For their tenants that ultimately end up there, as well as it's restricted to, you know, um, area median income for those units of who can ultimately, so it's rent restricted, right? 
when we're evaluating projects for an RFP, it's a rather in-depth process because HUD requires that we go into understanding all of the funding sources, ensuring they're committed, ensuring there's site control for the project. We're looking at the developer's capacity to even do a new construction project. We're evaluating whether or not their costs are reasonable, uh, allowable, and we do that type of evaluation through what's called a pro forma. And we're getting into the weeds of their dollar bills and where they align and it's to make sure there's no conflict because the home program is extremely complex and very regulated by HUD. Uh, we really have to ensure that all funding sources are committed before we can commit home funds. So with projects that the Affordable Housing Committee uh, awarded funds to last year, we had two projects that didn't get awarded uh, tax credit dollars. So they're going again to apply this year. So we can't give them home dollars until their sources are 100% committed. So it really limits where we can jump in and uh, project development from you know concept to actual construction, right? Because home is coming in at the last minute to do that gap financing. We also are required to evaluate um, you know, sure, the developer's capacity, but also property management because we're tacking on 30 year affordability periods. And so each year, you know, staff is coming to monitor them and say, you know, are your the rents on your units correct? Are, you know, all of your what you committed to in your application, are those units committed to the home funding requirements? Are income documentation and source documentation uh, for tenants being collected? Is that accurate? Are they eligible? You know, and we're really getting into is the property management capable of handling these kinds of requirements, right? Uh, you know, we don't take these lightly. So we're evaluating them at application. And so it becomes really in depth. Uh, we used to have multiple staff that did underwriting okay. and it's a really big lift. And so we would want to be able to give them a letter of commitment, which means we'd have to go to the affordable housing committee and get those approvals. So that way they can apply in their October application. And so we would normally go to affordable housing committee and right now about this time to have that part done. And that's where it becomes really difficult uh, feasibility to just throw something out there. I think it's important we're deliberate about we, what we do, which is why we wanted to do the RFI. Question please. So, the developers are doing their end. Is there a bottleneck? Because when that comes to the city, we don't have the capacity to do all the things on that proposal that you just articulated in a timely manner so they can turn it around. So I think that um, if we were to put an RFP out, we would be asking them to turn these types of applications around with little time. I mean, in order to meet, right? Because we are only one piece of the funding puzzle. And so I think that if we had an RFI, we would understand what projects are coming down the pipeline and where they are at in their process. And so when it came to putting out a home RFI, RFP, we would understand what projects would be applying and we would, in some ways be doing that evaluation type work <clears throat> in advance because we would be partnering better um, and understand it. That's what I say, if we understood what was coming down the road, um, you know, and I'm having those conversations and understanding the project now, that evaluation work down next year becomes easier. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really is, we can have conversations with developers at any point in time, but we only put the home RFP out at a specific time of year. I would like to see us put that out earlier in the year to give them more time, right? Gives us more time for conversations about their project mm -hmm. so we can negotiate barriers and still right, try to make these projects work because we wanna get the dollars out the door. Um, I think in a perfect world, we could certainly do those things. It isn't the case that we have somebody knocking on the door today saying, I have this project that's 100% ready. I just need $500,000 of home money. That it doesn't happen like that. In years past, we've had a really hard time putting home dollars out, you know, getting people to accept our money mm -hmm. when we do put that RFP out. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with, we really can't give you much money. Um, 
you know, we're not going to be the primary funder. And then we give, we tack on a lot of strings, right? With those affordability requirements. So it's give us a lot. We have a little bit to give you. And it's more about partnering and be part of being part of the solution about affordable housing, which makes us as a city advantageous in that goal. And so it requires partnerships and a little bit more planning than just throwing an RFP out, hoping somebody applies. I think if we want to be strategic and think about how are we meeting our goals around the number of units that we're putting out as a community. It's a different, slightly different strategy, which is why the RFI is a goal. It hasn't fallen off my list. I just can't do that right now because COC has become a priority because there isn't internal knowledge about how to execute that. Right. Um, so how much so money was left on the table? So yeah. how much money, how much home money was left on the table, basically? One point something? I don't, point two? but I, I think, I think that's a misunderstanding. There, Is that a misunderstanding? Okay. Well, Becky, you can explain that better than me, but it's, it's not a use it or lose it kind of. Program. Okay. 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 That, that, we'll start right there. I just, those are just some questions. I can reach out to you for more in depth, but. When we start hearing that, it's just alarming that uh, if, the, if the problem is with us, the city, that that money's not being deployed. And as we are the pass-through agency or organization for that, that, yeah. So, okay, thank you. I'm done. So, I, I do have a question about that. Um, and And... I'm feeling a little bit better, but if HUD gives us X amount of dollars and we don't <coughs> sorry, spend them in the right amount of time, does HUD come and take that away? And do we not get it back? <coughs> sorry, I got to mm -hmm. get water. So you are right. That, uh, it does make sense. Um, so. <laughs> It's a five year requirement to expend funds. Um, so, like I say, if you're talking about funds that would be recaptured by HUD, because we draw down those dollars, we don't have like a check account, a checking account that has all of those money, those dollars right now. It is very much we have to draw down those funds from HUD. And so, um, what ha would happen is it would, the funds would still stay with HUD. Um, but like I say, you're talking about projects that were funded much further in the past. I mean, when we have projects that were funded like last year, they're still expending dollars. So, you know, there could be opportunities where funds weren't, wouldn't be expended that we could commit to future projects, but we can't know that in those cases. Sure, we do have home dollars, but I think that um, in terms of me, I'm doing three jobs. No, I'm doing the COC application and I just don't have the capacity to do it. I think that um, if we had more staff, we could certainly mm -hmm. meet what everybody is asking us to do. Um, and I think that when we're, we can put an RFP out next year, we're not going to be losing money that was awarded to us for this fiscal year because HUD allows under the program the additional years to expend it. Funds that are committed to a project has to be, the project has to begin within 12 months. So we can't just commit funds and the project not start. So there are these mm -hmm. weird, conflicting requirements, so it does hinder us a little bit, which is why the home program is difficult to, to get money out. Um, I just think that, you know, if we want to do an RFP, I think Kirsten can speak to how we might be able to get resources for that. So, Becky, in no way am I saying you need to do more, please. No. You are doing an unbelievable job, so please do not hear that we're saying no you need to work harder in no way, shape or form. It's just to make sure that we as a city, not you as a department, but you, we as a city don't have repercussions down the road. So please, in no way am I saying work harder, Becky. Yeah. Nope. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> please. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that. I, I think that when, we're talking about um, ensuring that we are, you know, uh, meeting our funding requirements and our community priorities. Um, I think it's important that we're mindful and strategic about 
putting an RFP out mm -hmm. to make sure we're meeting the need. Um, and, and I think we need a little bit more time to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Becky uh, and, and, and everyone, I just want to add on to that. Um, the question, but a couple of acknowledgements. I'm just really appreciating uh, this, this discussion that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Council member mm -hmm. Wilkerson's questions and questions are so helpful. And Becky, honestly, um, I so appreciate the expertise you shared. I feel like I've learned so much. You know, we talk about like, as board members, how we really learn from staff. I feel like I've learned so much in the last however long, 15, 20 minutes that you've been talking. So that's, um, really, really helpful. And, and I'm just amazed at the amount of work that you're doing. Um, my question uh, to you is, so I, and I really appreciate you've like, you've put out a couple recommendations, like things that, you know, you doing this work, things that you see um, would, would make this process more effective. So another question I have for you is who do you know, like do you have an idea of who the strategic partners are that <clears throat> would, that would um, be interested in working with the city given, you know, the constraints that come, you know, like you said, there's a, uh, it's, this money is not easy for developers um, <clears throat> given all of the uh, requirements around affordable housing. So who are the partners that you would see out there that would be strategic um, for the city to go after in, in, um, in partnering on, on these, these dollars? That's a great question. I think a lot of the agencies that have been engaged with the housing action plan work um, are all great. So we're talking about Swicken Housing Ventures, you know, we're talking about um, community frameworks, those are all people that we, we really even made, like, we think about like SNAP. There are lots of people who are doing development. Um, it really is making sure we have the right fit for the program. And there are lots of people who can do that, including smaller developers. Um, and I think that that's where we have the housing action plan. You have the Spokane housing, it's the shag. I'm forgetting the full name of that group, uh, but some groups that have been developed under, um, you know, Melissa Morrison's work, I've had her come and talk to the affordable housing committee and educate the group about what she's been doing as well. Um, and understanding what the rest of those affordable housing dollars that the city has available, how we can kind of connect those two, because it's the same group, it's the same developers, and they're all weighing in. So, I, you know, I was listening to a council study session, um, not last Thursday, but the Thursday previous, and, you know, Darren Watkins was on there. There are a lot of people who can help if you want to think about like, how can we, who can we engage to have um, some input on an RFI? Those are all people mm -hmm. that I would engage with um, and talking mm -hmm. about like our community's priorities based on what we're currently experiencing. I mean, there are mm -hmm. plenty of folks. Those are the same, those are the ones that come to my mind. Mm, that's really great. And actually you're answering my second question or starting to answer my second question, which is, um, who are the stakeholders outside of developers that maybe aren't engaged or are only lightly engaged that could really help the conversation in ways, or if you have ideas around like kind of like innovative stakeholders that aren't involved that really could um, could add something to this. And I'm partly asking coming from, um, you know, I work in private philanthropy and if there's a role for private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a role for philanthropy. I love it. <laughs> Completely agree. I, I think that there are a lot of private funders that we can engage, I and mean, we've done that kind of engagement with on the homeless side to better uh, shift the system so we're all moving towards the same direction mm -hmm. and have an idea of what the plan should be. Um, and I think engaging private funders, you know, even people who are doing supportive services or providing some type of services to a lot of the people that, you know, we're talking about a specific group of people that are able to access the units that we fund under the home program, right? We're talking about people who are that 30%, 50% area median income. And so those people engage with folks like Chaz. I mean, there's probably some type of, um, I think coordination when we think about like service access in the community and where projects are located that <laughs> we could have even that level of engagement on to say, you know, what are the most important projects that the city wants to prioritize? I think there's room for everybody at the table. 
um, and just thinking about those things. And I, I, w I think it would be great to have credit funders too. It's definitely a different perspective. Yeah, we need to get, mm -hmm. I mean, we need to get better at, at telling the story and that's not, and have the staff available to be able to tell the story and to be able to do those right. sorts of things. Um, because we recognize that uh, there's an obvious concern around people experiencing homelessness and building um, transitional shelters, um, or even that sort of initial level of housing. Uh, and then there's that big donut hole of housing that's missing. So folks have nowhere to move into. And it's much harder sell for the public who um, often is, is saying what they see are people experiencing homelessness. So mm -hmm. then it's a harder sell to get them to support housing at these other affordable areas that allow people to improve and, and move on and open those other places. And I think that that's just a really difficult and interesting challenge. So one one other thing, um, uh, Becky, thank you so much. And and um, I echo what it, what Anne said. I was thinking the same thing. Um, part of what, at least part of how I imagine these board meetings, that since they are public meetings, uh, this is an opportunity for us to surface and be transparent with mm -hmm. things that are going on, which includes massive pressure on staff and limitation in time because you're being pulled in so many different directions. And so I think it is very, it's important for us to ask the questions, um, but we have a great deal of respect and trust with the staff at, of the CHHS department who do yeah. such amazing work. And so it's not ever mm -hmm. a criticism of the staff, even, even if we ask hard questions, it's not a criticism. Mm -hmm. It's always just wanting to be as transparent again in our role as 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 uh, serving the community uh, and being able to make sure that we're surfacing these these concerns. Um, but I also wanted to say uh, to Councilmember Wilkerson, since you are here, you heard how complicated the RFP is for home uh, that the affordable housing works through. Um, uh, affordable housing committee works through uh, once a year in addition to capital projects and things like that. Um, and I just want to again uh, remind that when, as we move forward in the process with the 1590 uh, monies and the 1406 monies, that there's a, a, a great committee that has done this very in depth work. And Becky's been in some of the conversations. Um, ask the hard questions when we see developers assuming how much project management is going to cost and, and we've pushed back and said that's not accurate, that's not realistic, or those sorts of things. So I just want to. Uh, remind the council that that uh, we have this this strong committee uh, um, who is has great expertise in these areas and can help with that work based on the priorities that uh, are set for from council. So just to wrap up and uh, like everyone was impressed with with Becky and why I let her explain that. Um, is you know it is super complicated and given everything that we are looking at and given you know it's not just a staffing issue it's also how that particular program works um and so uh what i i hope everybody walked away with is that this is not a no we're not doing it this is a we need to reposition it um to maximize what we have and you know it just means we're going to do an RFI instead of an RFP. And then, as Becky suggested, we will reevaluate and maybe we'll do that RFP earlier next year and, and maximize those dollars. And we really aren't at <coughs> risk of losing um, funds. So um, I think at the end of the day, that's what, what needs to be um, messaged. So that people um, understand that it's, um, it's, it's complicated. And we're we're put, putting the puzzle piece where it needs to go given the situation. Any other questions for Becky or Kirsten? Kirsten, was that the end of your director's report? Or okay, I just <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off if you had more to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you both for for being here and and walking us through that. Um, council member Wilkerson, do you have a city council update? Yes, and I'll be quick and succinct. So, uh, to the last conversation, I just want y'all to know that I have been working with the foundations. So that's Anovia, Empire Health, and Better Health together around them convening 
conversation about housing and homelessness. Oh, so okay. that is that is already in the works. Uh, right now, pretty focused on that art money um, and setting up that structure. So council has been meeting every week for the last month of setting up the structure of how to deploy that money into the community. There is an online thought exchange where people are going to put ideas in. That's all great. And in a week, we'll be meeting with the mayor side and actually finally coming together of how to get this money out there. So that's huge. The other thing that I think it was pretty fast, we did apply for the <coughs> Department of Commerce Rapid Capital Housing Acquisition. It's a grant. We don't know if we got it or not, but I I felt and I'll, I'll own it. <coughs> I started leaning in, it's like, hey, we just can't leave this money on the table. We have to apply for it. So Catholic Charity stepped up and is walking along beside of us and council has committed to the match. People are okay. anxious about the cost but this is the height of the market. And I don't think it's gonna get any cheaper going mm -hmm. forward. So, you know what? We can't say we wanna help the un homeless and unhoused. And then we have the opportunity to buy housing and we don't do it. So there's like there's nothing in between there. So that that's all I got. Uh, and I do thank the CHHS department. They are doing great work. And I just needed clarity because I hadn't had any. So. Thank you for providing that going forward. That's all I got. Just a lot's happening. Thank you so much. Any questions? Um, we have our two uh, committee updates, um, but uh, affordable housing, since the RFI was not able to go out, the affordable housing has not did not have a meeting. So we do not have any updates. Does the RFP evaluation RFP committee have any updates? Well, the nice thing is Margaret gave it for the <laughs> most part, which I really appreciated her doing that. But also the one that we did a few months ago, I don't, sorry, but to better health together, mm -hmm. um, they've done a letter of intent. They've, they've gone through a whole process and I can tell you that the programs that will get funded are Health and Justice Recovery Alliance and this is a program that works with people who have been uh, um, jail and mm -hmm. going through recovery. And so it's to work with rental list. Remember, this is rental assistance dollars also for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Spectrum is also going to be getting funds, the American Indian Community Center. Um, I don't know what PICA Spokane is. I can check it out. And Carl Maxey. Mm -hmm. So several funds and they're going to be within, we had set a, a cap of no more than 400,000 administrative and they're going to meet that. They're going to be under it and can fund more programs. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you. Better help mm -hmm. together. They're doing a yeah. good job mm -hmm. getting funds to people. Remember, this is the one where they're going to provide the upfront funds mm -hmm. so that people can go out and do the rental assistance. Then they'll come back to Better Health Together and Better Health Together will help them with their upfront dollars mm -hmm. that the city can't do. Right. So, so it's really this, exciting. This is a new, this is a, a new approach, right? Right. Yes. Right. Brand new approach. Yeah. And thank you to the city for um, to the department, George did a great job and um, thank you to the board for going forth with not knowing how much we were going to be spending. So more will be coming. And and good, great work with the evaluation RFP committee because leading up to the work, you did such a great job reaching out to um, potential community partners that we've not brought to the table um, yeah. in the past. And so that that really helped to shape everything as well. So really great yeah. work. Great work. Exciting work, actually. Yeah, yeah. Really exciting. Um, any questions for Anne for the evaluation RFP updates? Okay, any announcements for the good of the board? So. 
All right, well, hearing none, then do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And you're on time. I, like, yeah. Can you believe that? <laughs> I second it. <laughs> Thanks, Ann, for seconding it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Can I say aye? You can say <laughs> we, we, we will like the moral support for it, Gordon. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Adrian, All I right, remind meeting. What's that? Uh, Unity in the community <gasps> is August 21st. So just oh, keep that on your calendar. Good. Everyone should start seeing uh, that out there more. So it will be our big coming out party for all of us out of COVID. So look forward to seeing you there. If you can make it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. With that, we it's are a great good. event. Thank you all for being here and for a great meeting. Good discussion. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.